welcome. This is Stan Lee of Marvel Comics warning you to look around you. Your classmates, your friends, you never know which one of them may be a mutant. Stop listening to my goat. Oh, is that out? You're listening to my, uh, my goat. That listening to my, that, you're listening to my mistake. <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. Here on my left side is Monsieur Rish Outfield. Say hi to the folks at home, Rish. Hello. <laughs> Whoa. All right. And on my right side, we've got a special guest today. This one is Senor Marshall Latham. Hola. Say hello to the folks at home, Senor. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm gonna stop being cheerful now. (laughs) Because, uh, today, it's weird because this is gonna come out, I'm sure, like, at least a week or two from now, but today is the day that we all were delivered some bad news. We knew it was coming sooner or later, but yeah, today is the day that, uh, Stan Lee passed away. And, uh, when we heard that news... Especially being that it was a Monday, which is when we usually get together and record, we figured that this is definitely going to have to be our topic for the day. So we're here to do our tribute for Stanley Martin Lieber. Who was a veteran. Oh, yeah, it's also Veterans Day. But Veterans Day observed. Yes. Because Veterans Day is actually the 11th and today's the 12th. We hadn't done a That Gets My Goat in a long, long time, but it felt like Oh, hey, definitely let's do this. And uh, I wanted to make it special. I know Marshall cares a great deal about comic books. Or he, he knows more than I do mm. about comic books. And so I thought, hey, let's get him in here and to talk with us. I, I don't even know if we've ever done this before on That Gets My Goat. It's, maybe we sat down with Marshall in person one time. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know we've talked a lot offline about comics and things that are going on and old issues that we like to read but yeah i don't know if we've ever talked about it on a podcast before but we did actually have you on of that gets my goat back in the day or was it it could have even been an actual episode of the regular dune steve show but we did have you live in my study i remember one time you were down in town visiting and we uh, had you over yeah yeah we did so it's not a complete first. Oh, and we recorded at Marshall's hotel room one time, too. Oh, yeah, we did that, too. Huh. And at New Media Expo. Okay, so this isn't special at all. Thank you. <laughs> but I imagine that there's tributes like this going on in geekdom all over today. And good. Rightly so. I was, I, I, you know, you're not pleased to see that he's gone. But I was pleased to see how many tributes there were, how much news coverage there was. And, you know, he's significant to us, but then he's significant to the world at large, too. And that is uh, kind of amazing. Because for a long, long time, comic books were not cool. Comic books were relegated to the, uh, the bottom rung of the social ladder, and we've emerged from that, and then some. Yeah, that's one thing that I was talking with a friend of mine today about when uh, I mentioned that Stan Lee had died. And, you know, I mean, he's 95, so he's had a good long life and he's he's seen a lot. And I'm sure he's, you know, probably to the point where he was ready. Yeah, I think he's been in poor health for the last year or so. Yeah, when you're really old and you're in poor health, it's hard to keep going and stuff sometimes. But uh, the thing that I mentioned to my friend was that I'm glad that he lived long enough to be able to see the fruits of his labor basically conquer the world, (laughs) you know? He (laughs) came up with all this stuff so long ago, and it was a long, slow journey that, you know, I mean, shoot, Marvel went bankrupt in the 90s, you know, it was, it was nothing, uh, not very long ago, truthfully, especially in respect to his life, you know, 95-year-old person, well, the 1990s was not long ago, and uh, yeah, that's one thing that I really thought was great, was that he lived long enough that he was able to see all that stuff 
reach the heights that it reached because, you know, not a lot of people live to 95 years old, really. Yeah. I was listening to somebody talking uh, today about Stan Lee, and he was saying that he was in his 40s, I think, before Marvel really got going, before he was able to really make it work. And uh, that gives me encouragement, you know what I mean? Especially, like, in, in the days... When he did it, you know, 40 years old, people were, what, expected to live until they were, what, like 65, probably, like most people? It was like 65 to 75 was how old you get. So he, he was past what you would expect to be half of his life. And he was able to, at that point, be able to influence the world that much. It gives me hope for myself, who has waited way too long to really go for it creatively. And uh, at the very least, he's, you know, an example. Maybe I'm maybe it's not too late. You know, it can it can still be done. Yeah, because he was he was born in 1922. And so, yeah, I was watching an interview with him in uh, 1975. And at that time, he would have been, you know, like 53 or whatever. And that was when, you know, Marvel was at its high. Well, maybe not at its highest it was taking off. But, uh, it was pretty gangbusters back then. It truly changed in 61. That's when uh, the Fantastic Four came out. The Marvel Comics existed before that for a short time. It was Timely Comics, and then it was Atlas Comics. And then uh, I can't remember exactly when it became Marvel Comics, but they were just doing, I think they had a, some monster comics. And uh, Journey into Mystery. And they had uh, the Patsy Walker comic book. But uh, they wanted to do more, or at least uh, uh, Martin Goodman is who owned the comic book at the time. And DC just started to have a, a resurgence of its superhero comics. And so Martin Goodman wanted to do superhero comics. But, uh, you know, DC at the time was still Superman and the Flash and everybody was at the pinnacle of good health and they were all kind of one dimensional characters. And Stan Lee really wanted to do something different. But the story that I've really liked once I after I heard it was that, uh, you know, he was he was thinking about leaving comic books because he really wasn't doing what he wanted to do. And his wife, Joan told him, well, why don't you just do what you want? Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Just do the kind of thing you want to do. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. You're, you're planning on leaving anyway. He listened to her and came up with the Fantastic Four. You know, they were people that had problems and grumbled and fought with each other and, and you know, weren't the bright, shiny, happy people that uh, DC was putting out. And people loved it. And so they, you know, he kept going and building all these characters like Spider Man and Doctor Strange and Iron Man and all these different people. The Hulk. And then the Hulk, right? That was probably the second one. That's when Marvel started its big run <laughs> and becoming popular, is when he did what he wanted to do rather than just doing whatever he was told. I, so I always thought that was cool that his wife cared enough and just kind of gave him that encouragement to do what you want to do. And after he did that, he didn't stop. Yeah. I, I'd heard Stan talk about the mindset of working in comic books, uh, you know, that it was disreputable. He called himself Stan Lee and uh, it was a pseudonym and he was going to save Stanley Lieber for when he was a real writer, when he was writing books and, when he wrote the great American novel. When, yeah, right. You know, like Jack Kirby's real name wasn't Jack Kirby either. It's just this This was, they were slumming it in the comic book world. And he was always looking f toward the time when he could get out of that racket and, and be a real writer. But then after Fantastic Four number one and its huge reaction and the way that it changed the face of comic books... There has never been a greater missionary for comic books than Stan Lee. <laughs> this guy 
loved the medium and touted the medium for the rest of his life. He held it up and made it respectable, made it what it is today. And, you know, Jack Kirby was King Kirby, king of comics, but he died, I think, in 94. And yeah, he never got to see the world that we live in now, where a Black Panther movie makes a billion dollars, where, in you know, Avengers 3 makes two billion dollars, where every single school kid knows all these characters, but their grandparents know them too. That, that's just amazing. Where the President of the United States, now granted not the one currently, boasts that he's a Spider-Man fan. Right. And Stan got to see this stuff. Yeah, he, I, he was tireless. Always doing comic conventions and always doing appearances and interviews. And how many times you'd hear him tell those stories over and over again, you know, into his 90s, which is just uh, remarkable. And he, he was always so positive. And, oh, I think that that movie was great. Oh, oh I think the kid <laughs> they've got playing Spider-Man is great. And, oh, I love the way that they did that with the Hulk. And I just, I don't know where you get that kind of bottomless positivity, but he had it. Yeah, that's funny. The, the last time that I actually saw Stan Lee, I went to a panel that was supposed to be Stan Lee at this Comic-Con. But instead, he was sick and wasn't able to come. But by the time that the Comic-Con had actually arrived and his panel was supposed to be, he was feeling okay. He wasn't going to be able to make it out to the convention. But, you know, because he's Stan Lee, he, he doesn't want to leave the fans disappointed. So he set up and did like a Skype from his house, uh, did a Skype panel from his house and yeah that was one, <laughs> one of the things you know it made me remember that because yeah he says oh i think the, the the greatest thing they're doing is what they're shooting right now in hawaii talking about the uh, inhuman show <laughs> that was soon to come and bomb <laughs> yeah i'm glad jack kirby didn't live to see that <laughs> but yeah yeah he was always that way whatever was coming next was going to be the greatest thing ever yeah, and he was thoughtful too. He, you know, I mean, he was definitely upbeat and and a promoter and everything. But I, this interview that I was watching today from 1975, he really thought about things and and uh, had a philosophy based on comic books and and how important they were. And and uh, he talked about a, and I've seen seen these too. You know, Electric Company had their their version of Spider Man. And Marvel Comics put out a, uh, I think it was called Spidey Comics instead of Spider-Man. Spidey Super Stories, I believe it was Yeah, Spidey Super Stories. And they were very careful about what they put in there, how the things were worded and how things were placed. Because it was meant for kids that didn't know how to read very well and needed help learning how to read and and using these comic books, teachers were able to, to help these kids learn how to read and, and enjoy reading and those kinds of things. And, you know, he, he really did believe comic books were a, a useful form and, a, and an, a, an important form of expression, not just these weird superheroes and stuff. I went to a funeral just this weekend and uh, it's something that I've observed in the funerals that I've gone to, and maybe everyone has noticed it, but the person that had passed away was not... Uh, let's see, how do I put it? Help me out, Big. Always pleasant? <laughs> okay, there you go. It was, was, was not the most pleasant person, but now that they were gone at the funeral, suddenly all of their flaws were forgotten, and, and it was we're only here to focus on the positive, and it was remarkable in that way because I had a hard time with this person, and then all of that is forgotten, I guess, uh, when they're gone. But boy, with Stan, you just... That sort of thing's not necessary. He just... He was a, a, a real good person, the kind of person that his characters were at heart the kind of person you would aspire to be. 
I had a good friend who said that his morality was based on Spider-Man. Mm. Not on religion and not on you know, school, but the things that he learned from reading Spider-Man comics inspired him to try to be a better person. That he would see Peter Parker try and fail and have regrets and try to overcome whatever weaknesses that he might have. And lots of times that was an inspiration to him to be better and try harder and not give in to whatever baser impulses that he might have had. And, and to me, that was just, that was amazing because that was not my upbringing. But I, I really feel like Stan was that good. And uh, I, I, you know, I got to see him. I got to meet him on a couple of occasions. But the one that's the most memorable to me is the second time that I ever got to go somewhere where Stan was going to be was a very small comic convention they were having in Los Angeles. They, it was something that they do like the third Sunday of every month at the Shrine Auditorium. And, and a, f- a few people would come, but you'd really get to talk to whoever the guest was. You'd get to, you know, take their picture and get their autograph and ask them questions and stuff like that. And I, when they announced that Stan the Man was going to be there, I was so excited because I had gotten his autograph one time. And it's one of those autograph sessions where you stand in line for three hours and then two seconds later, it's time for the next person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. There's, there's such a turnout. There's so many people. And, they, and, and, and the person signing can't. They can't talk to everybody because it would be, you would be there for the rest of your life. Is it? And, and so this time I was so anxious. It's like, oh my gosh, and I'm going to ask Stan this. I'm going to talk to him about this. And I'm going to let him know how much he means to me. And it was on a Sunday. And the night before on Saturday, I got sick, coughing and all that. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I've, I've, t- I've got to feel better for tomorrow. And I woke up the next day. And I couldn't speak. And this is the only time this has ever happened in my whole life. I, it, it, I, it's, it's not just, you know, uh, my voice was messed up. My voice was gone. And so when my buddy Matthew called to say, uh, you know, I'm on my way. Are you, uh, is everything okay? It sounded like, I don't know. I, I, I can't talk, but yeah, I'm going to be that kind of... <laughs> and that, that is more than I was capable of doing. I can't explain it. Mm. Because it's never happened before. And I was like, oh, no, now I don't get to ask Stan my questions. But like I said, there were so few people that everybody that wanted to talk to Stan would get a chance to. And so (laughs) I wrote down my question. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't do Black Bolt sign language with him? (laughs) (laughs) My question was, you know, again, thank you for, for coming here. And thank you for all that you've done and for giving us these memories of childhood and that, you know, you made my childhood, Stan. Thank you. And my question is, looking looking back on your life, what do you regret? What is your main thing that you wish you could do over again? And there was an MC, a guy who, uh, you know, said, you know, hey, we want to thank Stan for coming out. And he said, uh, the next, uh, this young man can't speak. But he's written this, uh, this message. And it, it was weird because suddenly everybody looked at me <laughs> because I was weird. I was different. <laughs> I, I was a mute. I was a guy who couldn't speak. You were Black Bolt. And so he read this thing. And then, yeah, it's Stan, it wasn't a good answer. He said, oh, I, I've been so lucky. And so many good things have happened in my life. I would be afraid to go back and change any of it. But holy cow, dude, now he's gone. And to have thought that even once in your life that I, I've been so lucky, I wouldn't want to go back and change any of it. Who can say that? Yeah. And anyhow, maybe it wasn't a good story, but that's, my, that's, that's the story that I remember because I couldn't talk and I really wanted to tell him thank you and, and, and let him know how important he had been to me. And it just, by that point, he was already so old that it was lucky that I ever got to speak to him. We got so many more years with Stan than we get with anybody. 
unless they're Kirk Douglas. I, I, I myself feel really, really lucky that we've had him for so long. You know, he was in World War II. He's been around that long that uh, he remembers when, you know, Captain America number one came out. And, you know, he he would write these stories about Cap and the Human Torch and Toro and Bucky set back during World War II because he had been in it. And I always thought that those Invader stories were really, really cool. And I, I, I think it's my understanding that they never really sold very well because no kid wanted to read about the exploits of, of their dads. But, oh, I love those World War II era Cap stories. I don't know, if Marshall, if you ever read any of those. I have. But I love the kid sidekick, too. I, right. I, I've made no secret of that. Just, oh, my gosh. And that Submariner had a kid sidekick. And uh, what was the British guy... <laughs> called the british captain america not captain britain right no I, I can't remember that but even even human torch had a sidekick named toro at the time yeah just i i i loved those stories with the kids sidekicks and 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 the the fact that we were at war and we felt so clearly on the side of good and we were fighting against somebody that seemed so clearly on the side of evil it made those stories special in a way. Anyhow, yeah, I, I just I, I can't say enough about his life and the the fact that uh, that it, you know if he had just if if he had created Spider Man alone, that would be enough for me to be like, oh my gosh, this guy has c- contributed so much. But Spider Man is a drop in the bucket. Um. I mean, each of us could name 20 characters that we love that Stan created. Or at least had a part in. Yeah. It's just amazing the, the, the influence that he's got on our, uh, our society. Even before the comic book movies and Marvel Studio and whatnot kind of took over. Even back in the 90s, if you go that far back, he still had a gigantic influence on the country and and the world, even back then. I remember seeing a show where they were talking about when Marvel went bankrupt and they were, what, saved by, bought by their their toy company, the company that made their toys, Toy Biz. And I can't remember what the price even was, but it was basically nothing. And there was a guy who was talking about that and he was just like, oh, I just, I couldn't believe it. At the time, and I said to people, I'm just like, Spider-Man alone is worth a billion dollars. And, you know, everybody's like, ha, 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 no one's paying a billion dollars for Spider-Man. But the guy was right. Spider-Man's worth a billion and way more. His films alone, just Spider-Man, have raked in way more than a billion. You know, it's one of the most valuable brands out there. Adding on the X Men and the and the Fantastic Four, and Doctor Strange and the Avengers and the Hulk and Iron Man, you know all these things that he had a hand in. It's just amazing, and I, I've said before on the show that I would be complete. I could die happy if. So if a character that I created was made into an action figure, <laughs> that's all it would take for me. And oh my gosh, can you imagine the amount of action figures that Stan Lee could have made from the characters that he created? How, how many of them do I have in my own room here with me right now? There's dozens at least. <laughs> well, and he had that, you know, you know, Rish was talking about the World War II era. And, uh, you know, he had the, that history with Marvel comics and everything. And so when it started to become big, I mean, he brought back the Submariner through the fantastic four comic books. He brought back Captain America through the Avengers and, uh, you, you know, he pretty much reused the human torch <laughs> and only he made him, you know, Johnny storm instead of an, uh, Android character. And, you know, he, he was well read. I mean, he read, he knows Shakespeare. He knows a lot of the old classic literature. 
I mean, he really did, I think, want to become a, a great writer in that sense. And, you know, the Hulk is based off Jekyll and Hyde and things like that. You know, so he, he has that background to pull from. And I think that helped him a lot back in the day. Uh, he just drew on that. And his uh, big push, you know, of course, he's repeated it so many times, was make these characters that you can relate to as well as aspire to and be amazed by, but they're always relatable. They have the same problems you do. They have the same struggles and things like that. You know, Spider-Man might be able to swing through the city on a web and uh, it's stronger than eight men or whatever, but he still has to do stupid jobs just to make enough money to go to college and to pay the rent and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what Marvel was built on. And that was the model that uh, he came up with. And that was a great concept even 40 years later. You know, when the movie started coming out, I remember talking about that and just like, that's one of the things I love the most about Spider-Man is you get the scene of him trying to get the pizzas delivered in time. <laughs> you know, you don't get that in a Batman movie and you didn't get that in Superman movies. It was still a novel and interesting concept to see someone that has phenomenal cosmic powers but then they have an itty bitty living space you know i mean it's uh it's neat to see them being sort of just like you they can almost be you one radioactive spider bite is all it would take <laughs> i read an interview with kevin feige the head of marvel studios today and you know he is really the guy who's responsible for the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and he had uh, worked on some of these lesser films through the years. You know what I'm saying by lesser films, right? Like Ang Lee's Hulk? <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go, like Ang Lee's Hulk. And, and he paid attention to what was working and what wasn't working, and he had had many conversations with Stan Lee. And yeah, he just decided to take these characters... Um, as sacred is that fair to say yeah and say let's go back to the source material and be faithful to that source material and not be embarrassed that they're comic books and by doing that i think it legitimized some of these things i mean that's not the sole reason why the marvel cinematic universe worked i think the the biggest reason was a bunch of disparate characters that all exist in the same universe that know each other that could run into each other that's what was the most amazing thing about the marvel cinematic universe but in this interview i read with him today he said that after this thing exploded and you know avengers made a billion dollars and that stan said you know these are great times for the characters but the characters are going to outlive all of us and long after we're forgotten, people are still going to remember these characters. So don't get a big head. <laughs> and I can't really imagine Stan saying don't get a big head, but that, <laughs> that, that was Feige's words for it. And, and yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that that is actually true. I think that Big's grandchildren will know these characters and perhaps even they will know the name of Stan Lee even though he'll have been gone many, many years by that point. In the way that we know Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's name or Edgar Rice Burroughs' name or William Shakespeare's name. I was having a conversation just the other day with somebody, and I don't think it was big, about J.K. Rowling's success and that everybody wants to be a J.K. Rowling. Everybody. But that's never going to happen because there's only ever been one jk rowling but maybe i'm going to amend that and i'm going to say stan lee is a jk rowling is easily as big a deal as she is and stan created 10 harry potters exactly that's what i was going to say i was going to say she's got a long way to go to match up with stan lee yeah because you know you he was saying that you know he he was putting out five different books a week for a while there you know, and that was just a weekly basis of, of grinding out five different characters, comic books. And I'm sure he was involved in more than that. Um, and then, like you were saying, Rish, you know, being the, the missionary for comic books, 
you know, even above the writing, you know, he was just such a promoter and, uh, you know, just out there talking comic books with colleges and uh, just everywhere, you know, trying to connect with the fans. And, and uh, one of the things that he said he was proud of was that, you know, usually when people wrote into other comic books, they would write in, you know, dear editor or whatever. Um, but when they were writing in there, they were saying, hey, Stan and Jack or, you know, whatever else. And, you know, it really became a community he built. And that was him. That was all Stan Lee building that community with the uh, bullpen bulletins and the Stan soapbox and all those kinds of things. I mean, he he really built that community rather than just writing the comics. He he, I guess, lived it as well as, you know making a living at it. I'm curious when uh, you guys first, if you think back to when you were younger, when you first became aware of Stan Lee, as opposed to the creator, the characters that he created. Like I, re- I, I would have to say, I think it, it was, I'll bet we all have the same answer, dude. <laughs> I was going to say Spider-Man and his amazing friends is it that one or which one was it that he starts off every show? Hey, true believers. Hey, hey Stan Lee. Excelsior. He did that on Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And he did that on the incredible Hulk cartoon that was going on at the same time. Yep. Okay. So yeah, that that's what I was going to say is when I first became aware. And I remember <laughs> me being a little kid and thinking I was so smart going, and that guy's name is just Stan Lee. <laughs> and it was turns out yeah i was right <laughs> i was so smart i saw right through that <laughs> that yeah that, you're exactly right that's that's when i first got an understanding of who this guy was i didn't i still didn't understand who he that he came up with these characters or whatever but right I, you just kept hearing stan lee's voice yeah he was the personality behind the cartoon, the narrator. As always, it was a very characteristic voice, too. It wasn't just like, <laughs> Hi, I'm Stan Lee. Uh, welcome to our show. He had that really gravelly, Stan Lee, true believers. <laughs> and from that day forward, yeah, he, he just became more and more known to me. And the weird thing was, I didn't, I mean, I watched cartoons, obviously, but I didn't do a lot of comic books when I was a kid. And all the same, and I, I was thinking about this with like the Fantastic Four, for example. I don't think I ever saw a Fantastic Four cartoon, although I may have, because there was one. I, but the thing is that I knew the Fantastic Four all the same. You know what I mean? Like things that Stan Lee did, even if you didn't know them, you still knew about them. You know what I mean? People know the Fantastic Four, whether they've ever watched a movie or a cartoon or whatever. They've heard of them. They know the thing. They uh, they know Spider-Man, whether they've ever watched a Spider-Man show or not. They know the Hulk. Maybe they don't know Doctor Strange. It's beyond uh, any of that stuff. You know, you don't have to have watched that cartoon. And there's a, a lot of things, I guess, that are kind of that way. Like, I know Pokemon, despite the fact that I wish that I didn't. <laughs> I still know Pokemon, you know. So there are things that just rise to that level somehow. that They just bubble to the top of culture or whatever. But for one man to be behind so many of them, it's just, it's really amazing. Well, yeah, in 2018, it has to have been his most amazing year yet too because we had a movie of ant-man and the wasp both created by stan lee avengers created by stan lee and black Black panther Panther in the same year also created by stan lee coming hot on the heels of spider-man from the year before too and and thor ragnarok uh yeah man well i mean it is amazing Like I said, like we've said, that he lived to see that. They took over, they became what Star Wars was in our childhood, these Marvel films. And uh, new fans were brought to it in 2018 that weren't fans in 2017 
mostly through this Black Panther character. Yeah. Wow, that's insurance that he will be remembered for generations. And but also the what remarkable characters he created way back in the 60s that now they are being appreciated. That now, you know, I, I didn't know who Black Panther was. I didn't know who Daredevil was, but I do now. And one day the world will feel that way about She-Hulk, <laughs> who I love, and Man-Thing, who Marshall loves, <laughs> both created by Stan Lee. <laughs> Marshall does love his man thing. That's right. <laughs> Stanley didn't. Bring you know it. the the thing that's really interesting. On top of that is we may have not seen anything yet, because the Fantastic Four and the X Men are on the verge of joining the Marvel Universe, and you know they've had their run elsewhere over with Fox. That was, you know. Eh, depending on which one you're talking about. Fantastic Four didn't have much of a run. It was uh, relatively substandard the whole time. X-Men had highs and lows. But yeah, I don't... What lies in store for us now when we bring those on board as well? It'll be pretty cool. It will be. I I really hope to see a good, a really good Fantastic Four movie. So far, people have had trouble with that. So maybe, maybe it can't be done. I don't know. It, but uh, yeah, it it can be done. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing if they can really pull off the Fantastic Four the way they should have been all along. Um, X Men. I don't know if I'm as excited for them to join the MCU. I'm sure they'll do a good job of it, but um, that might feel a little bit more shoehorned in. But yeah, the Fantastic Four they've they've always been my favorite. And uh, I don't really have really? a reason for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was going to I was just about to say, why? <laughs> You've already said you don't know. Okay. Well, I, they're just iconic, I guess, you know, and, and just those, I, I did watch that uh, 1978 cartoon with Herbie and everything, but. Yeah, the, I know. actually watched an episode of that just the other day uh, on YouTube and <laughs> it was I think it was the first episode where they fight the fearsome four. Oh, wait, who's in the fearsome four? Because Marshall podcast about that. Oh, he called him the frightful four. Oh, the, yeah, the frightful four. You know, they they were the frightful four. Marshall was right and I was wrong. Oh, OK. Good, good old Marshall. I should have mentioned that before we started recording so he could have straightened me out. They, <laughs> I watched them fight the frightful four. <laughs> And let's see if I can remember who was in it. There was Medusa was in the Frightful Four. She was. She was uh, apparently had lost her memories or something and had become an evil person for some time. Sandman was in the Frightful Four. And trap the tr- something about a, t- a guy who made a tr- made traps. Yeah, tr- was it Trapster? Trapster, but his original name was Paste, Paste Pot, Pot Pete. Pot Pete. <laughs> 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 that was Paste Pod Pete. That was Paste Pod sure Pete. Yep. Oh my gosh, I've heard of Paste Pod. I never heard of the Trapster though. That's I mean not not that much of an improvement really, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's called himself Paste Pot Pete forever. And one time when he fought Spider-Man, Spider-Man insisted on calling him Paste Pot Pete. And it just <laughs> drove him crazy. He's just like, I'm the Trapster. And he's like, no, nah, you'll always be Paste Pot to me. <laughs> <laughs> Paste Pot Pete. And then the last, the, the leader of them was like the wizard or the yep. magician or was he called just the wizard? Just the wizard. Yep. Okay. Another guy I'd never <laughs> heard of. But yeah, they, they were taken on the Fantastic Four in this episode. And it was... Yeah, so you know, I think just watching that cartoon and then, you know, whenever I saw a comic book with them in it, I grabbed it. And, you know, with and I've always liked Ben Grimm, the thing. And uh, he's pretty iconic, too. I, you know, I think between him and Spider-Man, they're probably the most iconic. Maybe the Hulk as well, but... Well, certainly when I was a kid... Uh, I think the big three were Spider-Man, the Thing, and the Hulk. Right. Uh, but Thing, Thing's popularity has waned, and it's got to be because of those movies. Yep. Just if if those movies had broken out like they wanted them to, we'd be seeing. Well, it, do you guys remember there were Thing fists? You could 
punch things with, just like there were Hulk fists, but you still see the Hulk hands. You don't really see the Thing ones anymore. Uh, the Thing ones went with the movie, I think, so... <laughs> yeah, a good point. <laughs> when they dried up, there's no more marketing. But I, I just, I remember, I, I was not a Fantastic Four fan myself. I'm a Spider-Man guy, and it was neat, though, when Spider-Man would get together with the Human Torch, they had sort of bonded on a level that Spider-Man does, didn't bond with any other superhero. They were of an age, and the Human Torch was fun and popular, and he'd be like, come on, Spidey, let your hair down, and let's have fun. And Spider-Man would get to have adventures that were lighter when the Human Torch was around, and, and maybe they could do something like that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Introduce... Johnny Storm as a contemporary of Peter's, a teenager who uh, reacts very well to see there is another teenage superhero and the two of them hit it off. You know, they were always, with the smart remarks, they were trying to one-up each other and, and things like that. And there was a playful banter between the two of them that I don't remember there being with other superheroes who would encounter Spider-Man. Usually they were annoyed by Spider-Man or... Thought lesser of him. Spider-Man would banter with his villains and he would joke around and all that and you'd laugh. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I guess we were just talking about it would be cool to see them bring the Fantastic Four in. And yeah, we'd all like to see Thing fight somebody. But uh, yeah, I would much rather see Spider-Man hit it off with the Human Torch Right. <laughs> than to see Wolverine try and scratch the thing's rocky body. No, yeah, that that would be a really cool way to uh, to merge them in with that Human Torch Spider Man relationship. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I'd really like to see it work out. I mean, I, I've said this before, and I think it's still kind of the truth: is that the best Fantastic Four movie uh, ever made was The Incredibles because they did such a good job with. The various powers, and obviously they didn't, uh, you know, they switched the Human Torch out with the Flash, I guess. But they did such a good job with the various powers that all of them had and made it so interesting. And when you watch the Fantastic Four movies, they just didn't. They just weren't interesting, and you hardly saw them use their powers at all. Elastigirl made Mr. Fantastic look like a complete novice. (laughs) Yeah. And... I was just blown away each time she did something. Like, oh, wow, yeah, you could do that too? She made herself into a parachute. That's freaking crazy. And just all the things. And I never thought that Mr. Fantastic had neat powers until I saw The Incredibles. Uh, You know, the best thing he did in the Fantastic Four was when he danced at the dance party and he, like, made his arms long. Yeah, that's sad. But I love the idea of like a family of superheroes. And I I hope, you know, that people won't see that and go, oh, they're ripping off the Incredibles. Because <laughs> it's a neat dynamic. And the, the whole thing that, and I guess it's kind of been done by Iron Man and stuff. But just the fact that they, everybody knows who they are. They are the, this first family and they don't have secret lives or secret names they're just who they are it's just a different thing that you don't see very much and i like the idea you know of them giving press conferences they they actually gave a press conference in the uh first cartoon that i watched <laughs> giving a press <laughs> conference about their fight with the frightful four it's it's a different dynamic that uh, gets very little play in uh, superhero movies, and I'd like to see that. I, don't know, I, ho- I hope that it can be done well, be an interesting, fitting tribute to Stan Lee to continue to take the characters that he created, like Paste Pot Pete, and make them <laughs> something great again. <laughs> did he create Paste Pot Pete? He did. I'm sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess the guy wasn't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> if he only created him as the trapster to begin with. I don't know if they'd have the courage to, to bring back Paste Pot Pete. But. How come nobody mentioned that he was the creator of Paste Pot Pete in <laughs> any of the obituaries I saw today? I'll put it in my blog. <laughs> there we I'll, go. 
Big, who is your favorite Stanley creation? Um, it's probably the X Men. I know he didn't create all of the X Men, and many of the main X Men were ones that were created after he was off of the X Men, but still, many of the core X Men were Stanley creations, and. The X-Men were the ones that drew me. So before I saw X-Men 1, I wasn't into comic books at all. It wasn't my thing. You know, I thought they were all right. And I didn't have anything against them per se, but I just didn't get all excited about them in any way. And I went to see the X-Men movie. And then I had a friend at work that was big into comic books, and he told me a whole bunch of stuff about the X-Men, and then I went and saw X-Men 2 on the weekend. And so when I saw the fiery bird-looking shape in the lake, I actually knew, oh my gosh, that's the phoenix. That's uh, what my friend was talking about. And it got me all excited, and I was just like, oh man, that was great stuff. I can't wait to see the next one. And I went out to the library and started looking for comic books. Checked out a bunch of trade paperbacks of the x-men and i started reading them and uh just kept going from there i've got a whole shelf full of trade paperbacks of comic books right now on my uh my bookshelf behind me and i've got shelves upon shelves with action figures of iron man and the x-men and etc etc all these people like i said i probably got dozens of uh creations Uh, of Stan Lee now and it all dates back to that X-Men which drew me in so I think I'd have to say that they're my favorite it's interesting that we all have a different favorite though don't you think yeah well he had this theory that every comic book was somebody's first comic book and he had this theory that every character was somebody's favorite character and so you needed to Treat them with respect. I, I, I believe I remember Feige saying that. That there were some throwaway characters or things that they was like, well, we don't have to honor this one. I mean, this is just a, a little thing. And Stan was like, well, be careful what you call a little character because every character is somebody's favorite. And yeah, there have been moments when somebody super obscure shows up and... Uh, somebody cheers in the audience or somebody's like oh my gosh did you see howard the duck show up at the end of you know that kind of thing like when batrock the leaper showed up in captain america 2 it's sad how often i think of you saying i love to leap (laughs) you do this batrock the leaper impression i love to leap every time i see that action figure (laughs) including today i think of you saying i love to leap He does. He loves it. It's so great. And yeah, if they were going to do the (laughs) trapster, it would have to be something like that, where it's not the major villain, but it's somebody he's fighting at the, you know, the beginning of the movie or somebody, you know, we come in and the Fantastic Four is fighting the Frightful Four. (laughs) Right. And, you know, now that they're all under the same banner, who knows what they can do except for a solo Hulk movie. (laughs) I I don't know. Marshall did a review of the Inhumans TV series on his podcast, and you had passion for those characters. You knew the history of those characters, and I frankly knew very, very little about them. But, yeah, you can bet that there's somebody whose favorite character is Black Bolt, somebody whose favorite character is Lockjaw. No way, you're lying. And and Big and I both kind of like Medusa for weird reasons. <laughs> Just because of the hair, it's so long. Oh my gosh. It's... <gasps> Sorry, oh shoot, we're still recording. Uh, go on. <laughs> but uh, do we ever get to see Medusa fight somebody with her hair on that show? Oh, uh, you know. No. That's the... she, she grabs, what's his name? Maximus, Maximus, the mad, she grabs him with her hair and pushes him against the wall, but that's about it. Will it be too much of a spoiler to tell you why I never watched that show? No. I mean, you probably know already why I never watched that show. (laughs) I do, and and you've never told me this before. (laughs) Because they cut her hair. Yeah, it was on, uh, I saw it up on the monitor at work. 
where I work, I'm in a TV station and we have all the stations playing. So, you know, I was at work, the show was playing and I thought, oh, the Inhumans is coming. Oh, oh, I can't wait to watch that this week. And then they shaved her head. And I was like, I don't need to watch that ever. Okay. Yeah, that's like Ben Grimm never becomes the thing. He's just Ben Grimm. Yeah. <laughs> I was so irritated. I saw that and I was just like, okay, well, that's a, an easy way to cheap out. You know, now you just saved yourself millions of dollars <laughs> in special effects, I guess. But why make an Inhumans movie if you're going to shave her head? Because B- Black Bolt can't ever do anything either. He's got to stay quiet the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so there's just no powers whatsoever? I mean, come on. The only thing I've seen for that is there's a shot of Black Bolt in his Black Bolt costume and Lockjaw teleporting into like a street. And I was just like, oh my gosh, Lockjaw looks like Lockjaw. And that made me want to watch it. But yeah, I still kind of want to watch it. I actually looked for it the other day. Where did you watch it, Marshall? Did you just have it like DVR'd or something? Yeah, when it was, I saw uh-huh. it when it was on, on TV. I know that it was on Hulu, I think, when it first came out, but I, uh, it's not there anymore from what I can tell. So it's probably going to be on the Disney streaming app when that hits, <laughs> Yeah, along with all sorts of other things they're hoarding. No, they did do pretty good by Lockjaw. I, I did like him, except they, they did some cheats with him, too. But as far as his looks and teleport- teleportation and stuff, they they did that pretty well. So did Stan Lee create the Inhumans as well? Is he on the li- is that on the list too? Yep, we could put that on the list. Jack Kirby was pretty instrumental in them as well. He well, kind of came up with the concept and Jack Kirby was instrumental in all of them, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. They were basically a team. But he's been dead for 20 years, so we missed our chance to talk about him. <laughs> if only they had podcasts in 1990s. <laughs> There are other characters we're not thinking of that Stan is responsible for, like the Silver Surfer. Oh, yeah, that, that was his favorite character. Who uh, He has never been able to shine in the way that some of these other characters have. And I would imagine that that would be high, high on Marvel's list of characters to bring back and give their due. Um, I mean, I hate that they're going to do away with Captain America and Thor and on those as ongoing series, but they really do have a ton of potential new franchises like Black Panther, especially with obtaining um, all of these characters from Fox. Yeah. Nick Fury and shield was created by uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby as well. So there's another one that we haven't mentioned until now. Yeah. We didn't mention them. And the Howling Commandos. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the Falcon was the very first black superhero. And, uh, you know, he was created by Stan. And I, uh, Yeah, th- th- there are so many. And Big said he probably had 20 action figures. I, I probably have 50 <laughs> of characters created by Stan. Because, he, except for Venom, he created all of the great Spider-Man villains. Does and, uh, you know he just does Hulk Buster count as an Iron Man, or is it separate? Because I think he th- does. Would that count as a Stan Lee creation? Well, well let's let Marshall decide. Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up while you guys talk amongst yourselves. Well, I I don't think Hulk Buster is his own character though. Sure, but. It's you know, just, the, uh, it's like silver centurion armor Iron Man is still Iron Man. Yeah, but uh, you had mentioned the Silver Surfer and that you, you listen to Stan Lee talk about characters and stuff. And you can tell that he has a, a pretty strong fondness for that character of Silver Surfer. And uh, that first three issue run when, when Silver Surfer and Galactus debut, that's still regarded as one of the most uh, famous and iconic uh, comic book moments or issues that are out there. Yeah, the, the Galactus trilogy, right? It was three issues. Three issues, yeah. Like 48, 49, and 50. I'm going to have to give the judges ruling now and say that Hulkbuster armor was not created by Stan Lee. Hulkbuster first appeared in May of 1994, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that was past Stan's time. 
Okay, but I mean, that's like saying that he didn't create the black costume Spider-Man. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> just curious because I have like 10 different figures of the Hulkbuster Iron Man. And I uh, was wondering if I needed to count it or not count it. It's still Iron Man, so it counts. Moving on. So I don't know if you're ready to wrap up or not, but... Uh, I am, yeah. One of the things I worry about is that uh, Stan Lee just becomes, oh, that guy that does all the cameos in the Marvel movies. Because <laughs> on the, you know, a lot of the tributes, I mean, there were a lot of really good tributes today online for Stan Lee, but a lot of them were also, here's all of the Stan Lee c- cameos, and here's the top 10 Stan Lee cameos in the movies. And that was what people were posting and saying, RIP Stan Lee. And even when I was talking to my kids and my wife earlier tonight, and I, I said, uh, yeah, Stan Lee died today. And they're like, oh, does that mean he won't be in any more Marvel movies? And I'm like, well, yeah, let's <laughs> And you said, no, <laughs> he will still be there. Yeah. He will be Princess Leia in to every movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, it's possible that that could get lost. I don't think that that will be his lasting legacy. Um, I think that you see all of those because that's when you actually see Stan Lee. You know, Stan Lee is the guy behind the curtain. You know, he's not the one in front. So to show Stan Lee, you can show him sitting there giving an interview or you can show him doing his little cameos on on the movies. And obviously the cameos are going to be more interesting video. All I can say is I want a Stan Lee action figure. Yeah. Dressed as any one of his cameos. I don't care what it is. I just want a Stan Lee. <laughs> or they can do a whole wave of them dressed as each one of his cameos. <laughs> there was a figure uh, about 10 years ago that was a San Diego exclusive uh, Comic-Con. And it was basically just a Spider-Man figure with Stan Lee's head. Uh, and then you could put like a suit and tie on him. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then just this year in 2018, there was going to be a Stan Lee build a figure. Ooh. Uh, and you only had to buy two sets to get it. It was the top half and the bottom half. But it ended up getting canceled because there were there was a lot of negative press of people taking advantage of Stan and capitalizing on his oh, right his failing health and 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 his. Uh, his generosity to sign things and and license things and that and so that figure got canceled there were a couple that showed up on ebay that slipped through and i'm sure those are going for a ton now but there's no chance they won't do that now that he's gone as a tribute yeah i'll be there the day the store opens on force friday on excelsior dang what on true believer thursday (laughs) <laughs> I'll be there and I'll be the first one in the door to buy it dang it I want that I, I've seen this show uh, where they talked about like their their most wanted like Marvel Legends figures and they'll you know they're just coming up with characters that we haven't seen yet or at least haven't seen in a long time which ones do you want to see made into an action figure again and yeah my that would be my suggestion to add to their list I want a Stan Lee and it could be any one of those. It could just be him in a suit and tie, I guess, or him in any one of his cameos. Although, I don't know if we want to remember him as his cameos. He did a lot of them, so there'd be a lot of stuff to choose from. But do we want, like, Stan Lee, like, dressed as an ice cream vendor? Or, you know, wearing a security guard uniform or something? Or do we want just Stan Lee looking like Stan Lee? Or whatever he was wearing in Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> oh, please, kind sir, don't cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe that's what they should go with. The Thor Ragnarok sounds like the best one. <laughs> Let's do it. But yeah, Stan Lee dressed in some kind of crazy alien outfit would be fun. But one way or another, I want a Stan Lee, dang it. A six inch or a three and a half inch? You're going to go there, are you? <laughs> It would have to be six inch so that it would scale in with the rest of the Marvel Legends, of course. There you go. It it will be fun to see what they do in the movies forthcoming. 
you know, we had these movies in 2018 that had Marvel Studios and the IO became a 10 for the 10th and a 10th year of Marvel Studios and I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't get some tribute to him in all the movies that come out this this next year. Maybe show him in that montage at the very beginning, you know, the Marvel logo that shows the characters and 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 dedicate something to him. I think uh Captain Marvel is first out of the gate, and so they'll probably be able to do that if they want. But I wouldn't be surprised if Avengers didn't have a big tribute to him, too. Yeah. And he'll be in both of those. So Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I assume they've shot that already, and he probably did a cameo for those? He did, yeah. Yeah, I think they did some ahead of time because they knew he was, his health was failing. I think he'll show up in... Uh, Dark Phoenix as well, even though I'm not sure I will show up for that. <laughs> <laughs> was he in uh, Venom? Did either of you see that? I never did. I Yeah, I th- I, he was in Venom. Nice. As usual, just a guy on the street um, that you see for a second. And so, why not? He, he was willing to do it. And yeah, the kids might not know who he is if it weren't for those those cameos and uh because the, there's a face to the name in the same way that you and i wouldn't know who he was if he didn't say this is stanley <laughs> now we catch up with spider-man and his amazing friends you know I, I we've all gone to conventions and uh a lot of celebrities will come to these conventions or celebrities great and and small and charge just a fortune for autographs or for a photograph with them and at the one not the one that you went to big where he skyped but the time before that he was coming and my nephews said that they wanted a picture with stan and i said oh geez guys it's a hundred dollars for a picture with stan i mean that's so much money and my nephew said oh well how old is stan and (laughs) i think he was like 92 at the time and uh I was like, oh, shoot. They're probably never going to get this chance again. And so I plunked down $100 for a picture with Stan, me and my nephews and, and the man. Uh, and, and so now, you know, they, they will always have this, that they, uh, they met the creator of the Marvel Universe. And now that years has gone, have gone by, I don't care about that $100. It's, I would have spent it on something anyway. But now, you know, we have memory and... I have a rather unamusing story about it, too. So there you go. Story of feeling guilty. About? About wanting to say no and then realizing, oh, shoot, you're right. No, no, not at all. I mean, $100 is a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Mark Hamill wanted $100 to get his autograph, and I, I couldn't do it, even though he's Luke Skywalker, even though he saved us all from the Death Star. So... Uh, all right. Well, I think we've uh, I think we've said our piece. You, any final thoughts that either you guys wanted to say before we're done? No, I'm just I'm glad that uh, I've gotten to know Stanley's comics and gotten to know a little bit more about the the man, Stan the Man Lee. Yeah, like Rich says, he's he's very positive and promotes goodness. So uh, I think that's good. It's it's nice to see positive people in the world, and it's sad when they're when they're gone. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you, Marshall, for coming on our show. Big thanks for sitting down. It's past one in the morning where you are, so thank you. No problem. I would do it any time to talk about Stan Lee. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. Stan Lee was so great that if I could be a quarter as awesome as he was, then I would be seriously overachieving. So thank you, Stan Lee, for what you gave us. The world is better because you were there. Enough said. (laughs) Nice. Excelsior. (laughs) Until next time, true believers. Signing off. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Atfield. And I'm Marshall Lee. See you, everybody. That Gets My Goat is produced under Commander Commons 
average using non-commercial, no deliveries, 3.0 license. But you have my permission to steal it. Like a hundred dollars is a lot of money. But they were right. <laughs> does, does your does your nephew remember that fondly at all? Uh, I I don't know. I I didn't talk to him about it. They will someday when they see the picture in the future. Now I want to. I'll go wake him up. <laughs> hey hey what? I know it's midnight, but do you remember when we went and got your picture with Stan Lee? I'm doing a podcast right now. Tell me how you remember that fondly. Okay. I hold the microphone up to him and it's like, I hate you, Uncle Rich. You can catch it live. You heard it here, folks. All right, I'm back, guys. They said fondly. <laughs> I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 